So Tim, maybe if you want to go ahead and get started and right. introduce Mary to the group. Okay, great. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Mary McNally. Mary currently serves as the Executive Assistant Dean for Administration at the School of Veterinary Medicine at the University of California, Davis. Mary has worked in various roles at UC Davis for 17 plus years. And prior to joining UC Davis, Mary served in California state government as a health programs manager. Mary lives in Davis, California, is married, and has a son who is in graduate school. Mary received her PhD from UC Davis in 1993 and is an alumnus of Villanova, class of 1983. Today, Mary is going to talk to us about moving from Villanova to college to career. And these are tips from an alumna. Please welcome Dr. Mary McNally. Yay. Thank you. Welcome, Mary. Oh, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Tim. That was so nice. Um, Thank you. Hey, everyone. I am so happy to see you all. Um, it's a, my pleasure to chat with you a little bit today. And I have a few slides that I want to share with you all about um, oh, just some things I've put together, my learnings over uh, my educational um, my education and my career. And so um, afterward, I hope to chat with you if you've got some time. So uh, I think I'll start by sharing my screen. Okay, Tim, how does that look? Good, okay. So this is, um, a uh, little dog here. I work at the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. So I'm an administrator there and I just kind of wanted to share a few things with you. As Tim said, I'm an alumna from 83. So that's nearly 40 years ago. So, um, so I'm just uh, wanted to prepare an outline for you just to kind of go through what I was chatting about today. Um, I'll give you a little bit of my background, um, some of my fond memories of Villanova some true benefits that I carry with me from my years at Villanova and a few observations that may be helpful to you, um, little details about what I do now, and then just some friendly parting advice. So as Tim mentioned um, somewhat, I'm, I'm Mary McNally and I, was, I graduated in 83. Um, after that, I I went to the University of California, Davis for my bachelor's and master's and uh, PhD programs. Um, I like to think of it as in applied economics, but it was uh, managerial and agricultural economics. Actually, um, that is a kind of a business degree up at UC Davis. Um, you know, after that, I worked for California state government. I worked in the energy consulting industry and I ended up in higher ed, which is uh, somewhat of a winding career path. So um, it seems unusual, I guess, a little bit unusual, but um, you know, it seems that Villanova has provided me with a foundation to be able to explore alternatives. And you know, I ended up in a place that I'm very happy with. Um, I currently serve as an executive assistant dean for the School of Veterinary Medicine at Davis, at UC Davis, and it's like a CFO. Chief Financial Officer in academia. That's, we have different titles, but that's what it is basically. Um, next slide. And so, you know, I, I was thinking, how did Villanova make a difference for me? And I, I must say, I have extremely fond memories of Villanova. I played volleyball there. I was on the yearbook committee. I had some really inspiring teachers, um, and they really helped me develop a passion for learning. And I bet you that you've seen other presentations like this and people say similar things. Um, I had Father Vogel for algebra, Mr. Vignal for philosophy, Father Gary Sanders for history, uh, Mr. Sturba for calculus, you know, and I could list off many others. It's a very vivid memory in my mind. Um, what I truly appreciated was the rigor of the curriculum uh, and the challenge, and it really kind of raised my standards and my preparation um, throughout life. So I, you know, I look back, honestly, um, at VPS as kind of setting a benchmark for what, you know, what good education really is, honestly. Um, another thing I really appreciated was the one-on-one -on -one help I got. Uh, 
you know, I, I, I still look back fondly on that and the, and the fact that, you know, whether they were um, clergy or lay teachers, they really cared that I understood material. So um, that was pretty great, honestly. And it really helped me because then I went from Villanova, which at this time was about 250 students, I think in total, I'm not sure what it is now, but um, I went to a large public university and that was a bit of a culture shock for me. Um, but I had some excellent study habits that I had learned and cultivated at Villanova. Um, I really learned how to be curious and try alternatives. Um, and I learned how to bounce back from failure, frankly, and figure things out. So that has, has been a help for me throughout my life in various, in various avenues, honestly. Um, so let's move forward. Um, so I, I just put together a couple of observations. These aren't really you know, recommendations or rules to live by, but things that I've observed. And you know, one that I can reflect on is that you really have more time than you think. Um, in college or even preparing to get into college, everyone's concerned about picking a major, getting into classes, at least at a large public university, certainly, um, you know, and finishing on time. Um, I waffled between a major of economics or a STEM field like engineering, I think physics as well. And, you know, I really, it took me a couple of years to really to realize that I wasn't suited to engineering. And then it took me a little while to admit that to myself. So I felt, oh my gosh, I'm behind. I screwed up. I've made, you know, I've, what am I going to do? And so I, you know, I, I, I realized, all, I had to realize that it was not the end of the world. I'm going to regroup. And I took some summer courses. I finished my, my bachelor's degree. And, you know, along the way, I kind of struggled with career counseling at a large public university. And so I, I had to figure out, you know, where can I seek advice? Where are my resources? And I, I finally found a peer advisor that I could really talk to, not a faculty member necessarily, but a, you know, a group of peer advisors. And that really helped me. So it was, it was, I felt again, that my resources and my problem solving skills from Villanova really, really helped me there because I was just, you know, searching, if you will. And a lot of people do. Not everybody knows exactly what they're doing when they get into college. I would be surprised, you know, if there were many of us who did. So, um, you know, another observation, honestly, is that um, lifelong learning is a thing. So, you know, you're never really done learning. And that's something that Villanova really inspired me to kind of cultivate throughout my life. Um, I, I figure things out, you know, I've learned to figure things out in formal and informal settings and continuous, continuously learn. So um, I tried to remain curious, you know, going to grad school was a benefit to me and also, you know, continuing to pursue learning while you're working. So you, you know, if you don't go to graduate school, you're taking a job, you're still learning, right? And, once you graduate from college, you, there are many things that can, you can do to keep your skills moving forward. So your employers um, often encourage you to pursue education because it benefits you and it benefits them. So you know, when you get a job, look for those opportunities. Often employers will pay for you to have additional education or you know, to, have, to pursue, like I did, um, certificates in change management I did and leadership and diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, I found those things very valuable and different than, um, you know, learning in a higher ed institution per se in person, but, but fantastic nonetheless. Um, you know, lately colleges and universities permit you to stack these certificates, they call it, and, you know, you can actually obtain a master's degree by stacking certificates or including those as credit for online degrees. So just other ways to keep learning throughout your your life, because that's crucial, I think, um, as you, you're going to have to, you know, bend and maneuver as you, as you work through your career. Um, another observation is persistence, and it pays off. So just you, when you think, you know, that you figured out college, you need to figure out what you have to do after college. So, um, and college goes by, you know, really fast. So, you know, you take some time with this. I chose graduate school because you know, I love to study. And then I, other than that, I had no plan. So, um, you know, I decided, well, I must pursue a PhD because that seems like it's a hard thing to do and the right thing to do. Um, 
you know, four years in, I realized, oh my gosh, I'm writing my dissertation, which is kind of the final paper. And I decided I didn't want to be a professor and I didn't want to live in Washington, DC, which is where a lot of my peers were headed to for um, the policy world. So, you know, what, what did I do? I, I finished my PhD and then I pursued something different. Um, but, but keeping in mind always that, you know, I was trying to keep my feet moving and um, realized that the skills that I learned applied in, in a variety of new settings. So um, I think it's just keeping your head, head and your wits about you and trying to figure out, you know, what do you do next? How do you keep going? Um, gosh, another observation that I had that I'm hoping is beneficial is that mentors are important. And so it's important to find some, one or some, and be one also. You don't have to be 57 like me to be a mentor. You know, you can be a mentor at the age of 25, 22. You know? So um, when I reflect on, you know, the most rewarding things about my educational experience and my career, you know, two of the top things that I think of are finding a great mentor and serving as one. So uh, after grad school, I worked in state government. I worked in industry for eight years, and then I decided to return back to you know, higher education and academic environment because because I missed the energy and the mission of higher education. So that really attracted me. And, you know, it took me some time to figure out my bearings, you know, and the right role for a person with a PhD who is not a teacher formally and not a researcher. So, so what did I do? So I had to, you know, figure this out and I, I found a mentor. I'm an introvert. It was not, it's not an easy thing for me, but I knew it was important and I sought someone out. And I had, I, I admired someone whose name was Tom and, and I, he was a senior academic administrator. And I said, you know, I want a job like his, I want his job. You know, I, I, so I, I asked, you know, I asked him, you know, hey, can we have coffee? Can we talk about your career path? And, you know, honestly, his was as winding as mine. And so a lot of people, you know, take time to go on different paths. And so, you know, now I serve as a mentor and um, I learned a lot from mine and I still keep in touch with my mentor, Tom, you know, after 20 plus years. So I think that's just something super key that, that really helps you in, in this, when you, when you get out into the working world. Um, I think this is my last observation, not sure, I can't recall, um, but it's, you know, find your people. So you hear this all the time. Um, and I think Oprah says this, but it's important to find who you like to be with. And it really holds true in your career too. So um, I have two pictures on this slide, one of my extended family with my dad and mom up in the front, and then my siblings and their spouses and my spouse in the back, and then my cousin as well, I think. And then below is my immediate family. Uh, you know, so I'm, I have a small immediate family and that's, um, you know, super important to me. That's my son and my husband and myself. And, but I also have, you know, similar colleagues, close colleagues at work. So, you know, I think I found my people in where I am now and it's, it, it matters what you do, but it matters who you do it with. So um, in my current role at, at the vet school up here at Davis, you know, I've been here for 10 years and, you know, the vets and the administrators like me and the researchers, you know, we have something in common and we, we enjoy public service. We like it, educating the next generation and we care for animals. You know, those are all things that really resonate with me. So it's, it's kind of, you have to look at that piece of it too. Like what really makes you happy? Um, you know, who do you like to be around? So um, I wanted to just hit a little on what I do on a daily basis. You think, um, you know, what's it like, you know, in my job? Um, so I serve as an academic administrator and like a CFO for this veterinary school. And I've done it for 10 years. Prior to that, I had a similar role in the business school at UC Davis. So, um, so this role suits me, I, I think. Um, it's like, I work in what could be termed like a small city. It's a, camp, it's a little campus unto itself over here in Davis on the west side of the campus with 2,500 employees. and a $260 million budget and a million square feet in buildings. And we have various locations around California, um, San Diego, Paso Robles, Tulare. So very interesting and varied. Um, my role is to serve as um, part of 
the dean's leadership team. The dean is our CF CEO, if you will. And you know, we, we have to figure out what's our strategy around you know money, around personnel, around IT, you know, facilities, capital investment, and safety, because we have a lot of clinics and labs, and safety is a big deal. Um, and so what I really do though is I'm a problem solver. And so that's you know, I, I'm sort of there to fix all the odd ball things that happen in all these various areas. So um, that's, again, I'm drawn on my skills from Villanova about how, you know, you have to learn, you know, you have a high standard of rigor in your curriculum. You have to figure out, figure things out. You have to work in teams. Um, it's the same, you know, I, I sort of feel like I'm doing the same thing if you will. And so I, I move from kind of a strategic level to a tactical level every day. You know, it's working at the big picture and then working on the details. You know, both of those things um, I address and I, I love that about my job. So um, I really feel that when I look back, Villanova gave me a foundation to do that. So, um, oh, my parting friendly advice um, is to take time to know yourself. You know, you, you have to figure out who you are. Um, this took me forever to do this, but you know, it's, it's just how it goes. Um, after my graduate program and I was employed, um, I discovered various tools and you know, people have put those kinds of tools in front of me per se, but I've also looked into this a bit and you can under, it's, it, it was helpful for me anyway, to understand how you interact with others, how you process information, you know, where you get your energy. All these things are kind of key to, you know, how you can have a successful and happy org life. And so, two that helped me, and maybe you've heard of them, are the Clifton Strengths Assessment. Um, it used to be called the Gallup Strength Finder um, tool. But you know, a couple of my strengths resulting from this assessment were that were that you know I'm a learner and I'm analytical. And so there's a there's a whole sort of program that you can sort of read about once you take the assessment to see, you know, how, how you work, how you learn, how you interact with others. And I found that helpful, interesting, lots of insight there. Uh, the other one that I've taken is the Myers-Briggs type indicator. Probably you may have heard that. There is, you know, if you Google that, you'll see there's some controversy around the inception of that test and the development of it. But nonetheless, it's still broadly used. Um, and I just took it the other day with a leadership group um, I'm, what they do is they kind of, you know, assign you an acronym, if you will, it's a little bit reductive, but I'm an INTJ, which is introvert, intuitive thinking and judging. And so it's, it's interesting because there's a whole slew of these indicator, these types, and you kind of understand who you are and then who others are. And it kind of is interesting about you know, how you can interact with others, others who are extroverts, who I have, you know, kind of a different way of getting energy than an extrovert does right, or different ways of processing information. So it's kind of important to acknowledge that kind of, um, dif those differences, because you're gonna be working as you are now in teams, you know, up and down the managerial chain. Uh, it's just, it's useful to know kind of what makes you tick and where your comfort zone is and you know, how to expand outside it. So um, I like those two tools, I just wanted to share. So uh, I may have gone pretty fast, Tim, but I think I'm finished. Yes. So um, I just wanted to thank you all. Uh, I'm super happy to answer any questions. Um, you can always contact me at the email address here at Davis or text me, honestly. I'm, again, uh, I feel fondly about Villanova. I haven't been good about staying in touch, but um, I think Tim has me on his list now. So um, thank you very much. And I'm gonna stop sharing and then I would love to, to chat more if you've got time. Thank you, Mary, that was wonderful. Good, good to hear your, your points. And so what we've done in the past and I encourage students to do is go ahead and put your questions into the chat and then uh, Mary can, um, look through the chat and answer those questions. And I'm gonna start off with one. Oh, thank you, Sandy, good. 
finding a mentor is for me as easy as asking someone to copy. So that's how I did it. Um, but mentors are super key and I'm not the type that really seeks out mentors. And so you, if you are or you aren't, it's important nonetheless. So, um, you know, ask someone to copy, ask, you know, you don't have to say, will you be my mentor? <laughs> you can say, you know, hey, I, I've seen you in action, or I, I'm curious about your role, or how did you get from point A to point B? You know, did you always know you wanted to be this, this type of career, that kind of thing? Um, people are, people love that. They love to talk about that kind of stuff. So you just have to broach the subject and 95% of the folks love doing that. So that's very helpful. Thank you. What is your best advice? Okay, the question, what is your best advice to get into the vet medical field? Okay, great. So I think, um, you know, a lot of it is, you know, demonstrating that you have a passion for vet medicine, right? So, um, you know, the students that come to our school are talented students naturally, but usually have kind of, um, you know, really connected through shelter medicine programs or through their local vets, you know, serving as a type of intern, um, really kind of getting that kind of hands-on experience that demonstrates that you're, you're really interested in this field. I think, you know, all the, the things that people tell you about, of course, you know, boy, you need to really excel in the sciences, that sort of thing. Well, certainly that helps. Um, but I think, you know, if you have an application that demonstrates your passion, you're going to get into a vet school around the country. Um, you know, there's not that many of them. Vets are in huge demand right now. So um, it's, you know, it's almost like a strange boon in veterinary medicine because of the pandemic. So everybody needs a vet. Everybody has a pet now. So um, I think it's really demonstrating your passion when you're, when you're thinking about putting together your application. So thanks. Questions, okay. What opportunities do you have to interact with undergraduate students? Oh, okay, great. Um, wow, so we, you know, I, we all love interacting with undergraduate students in our school. Um, you know, we try a lot to, as they say, facilitate that pipeline from graduate, undergraduate to graduate here in our school. And so often, you know, undergraduates are serving as interns in our school and we get to, I get to help you know create funding mechanisms for that to happen frankly um, undergraduates often participate in research in our school uh, so we're you know developing scholarships and looking at you know sort of opportunities you know I'm looking at other other colleges on our campus um, to connect undergrads who are in let's say animal science or they're in um, well, they could be in anything. They could be in history, and we want, you know, we want them to come over and do some work with our faculty members. So I get to, I get to do that. I get to interact with them, undergraduates um, in their student government, and uh, that's fun for me. Honestly, I don't get a lot of that, but when I do, it's 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 super fun. So I see a question there, Mary, that was oh, from Mary Jane, a student. How many mentees do you have? Oh. Um, let's see, I would say three. I mean, I, you know, I'm not a, um, I, you know, I try to devote some time to my mentees, honestly. And so I have three that I, that individuals who are, you know, at various stages in their careers and not all, you know, not all three of them are here at UC Davis. So, and, um, yeah, so we usually meet on a regular basis. We usually catch up on, you know, what, what's been happening um, in their lives. Um, you know, it's surprising how, you know, there's a lot of commonality, even though they might be in slightly different stages of their career. And I'm, you know, I don't like to think I'm, a, you know, a senior member in my career, but, you know, I'm up there. And so, um, you know, we connect frequently and, you know, frankly, over coffee. So, um, or they come to my office. So how often do you meet with them? I have regular meetings with them monthly. So um, 
uh, I think it's super important. And, um, you know, I'm trying to encourage them, even though they're earlier in their careers, to also do this because, you know, especially, you know, people can't, sometimes it's, it seems odd, like, how do you get into these various jobs? How, how do you, you know, how do you make it up the career ladder in various places? And honestly, um, you know, you can certainly apply for various jobs, but it helps to kind of have that personal understanding and connection. And, um, you know, I, I wish I could say I was super active on LinkedIn, but I'm not as much, but, you know, I, you know, in my own network, you know, in the campus community across the UC10 campuses, um, you know, networks are important. And as an introvert, I've had to learn that. So. I like that you bring that up because I think it's good for our students to know that, you know, every new situation you're in along the way, keep track of the people you've been with and you know, and yeah. you know, stay in touch. No, absolutely. It's, it's, it's super important. And it's, I think, you know, I was watching a few of these other career talks on your website and a lot of people referenced that, you know, people show up in your lives in different times and different places. And it's wonderful if you have had that connection, it really, really helps. Um, and it's, you know, more than you would probably think. So. Um, Is there anyone uh, from Villanova that you're still in contact with? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm in contact with my friends on Facebook minimally. I wish I was a more crazy Facebook person, but I'm not so much. But, um, you know, uh, certainly um, trying to find time to go to the alumni barbecue. Just got the postcard from Tim, I think, June 27th, I think. Is 25th. Oh, 25th. We hope 25th. you'll come. We hope you'll yeah. come. Yeah, yes. Um, let me see, looking at the chat. Uh, oh, okay, can you describe your daily schedule? What's a typical day like for you? Right, so um, yes. So just uh, my daily schedule involves, I guess what I like to do is have a mix of, you know, there's, of course you can have a zillion meetings, right? And especially these days with Zoom, it's so easy to be on Zoom all day. So I really, really try to avoid that. Um, we're coming back in, now, I've been in person pretty much the whole time, but a lot of folks are coming back and it's it, we're connecting more in person and that's super important. So, you know, typically I'm getting in around eight in the morning and I'm, I'm usually, you know, with my job, I've got, you know, a bazillion emails like we all do. I mean, I don't know if you guys still do emails, but, but we do. And um, so I'm addressing emails, trying to figure out various little things that have happened. Um, you know, often there are strange things that happen in our laboratories, um, you know, chemical spills, somebody's injured, somebody, something happened. Um, also, um, you know, dealing with various financial snafus via email. And, and then, you know, usually I'll have a couple of meetings in the morning and a couple in the afternoon. That's how I like to frame it so that I'm not completely um, locked into meetings because I need to sort of have a little bit of boots on the ground time. And, um, you know, I, I try to, as I mentioned in the slideshow, I guess I try to be strategic and tactical each day. So I try to make sure that I'm working on the big stuff, you know, like, gee, I have to make sure I can figure out how to fund, you know, this new clinical trials program. Um, at the same time, you know, I have to figure out, um, you know, a thorny HR issue with a particular staff member. So, um, trying to kind of keep, you know, the big projects moving and the, and the, other, the other stuff that happens throughout the day moving. So I don't like to be the person that is the bottleneck. And in, in this job, you can't be. You've got to be the person that's always moving stuff through. So um, I usually leave the office around six. Um, and, you know, I'm, sometimes I'm working at night a little bit, but, you know, I, I have a family and um, this is a good role for that kind of lifestyle so um okay. do you see the question do you participate in any internships while you're on your way to obtaining your phd and if so what type yeah right i did so well when i was doing a phd we had um so research associate or research assistant type of jobs and i certainly did a zillion different ones a zillion different you know research assistant jobs from 
you know, lots having to do with, um, you know, agriculture and business. Um, you know, a faculty member would have a grant and I would, uh, I would apply to be on his grant or her grant with them and, you know, do a particular time, time limited project with them. I also was a teaching assistant, which I also really, really liked. Um, and I worked, you know, for um, an almond company for a while as an intern. Um, so lots of different things. Um, some resonated more than others, but a really good way to figure out what you like and, and who you like to work with, honestly. Um, I think my favorite internship was working for the California Energy Commission as a kind of a intern and research assistant. And I ended up working there for a while and I really enjoyed that. So, you know, one of those did pan out in the sense that I ended up working there after my, um, a couple of years after my PhD. So um, those are key, honestly. And, you know, um, it's hard to do unpaid internships, right? But sometimes, you know, you have a paid and you have an unpaid. Now uh, it's hard sometimes to do that, but I, I recall doing that just to get some experience, to be honest with you. So, um, tips for getting into UCD. Ah, okay. Well, tips for getting into UCD. I think I, I would say showing a passion for UC Davis and being kind of well-rounded. I think that's, you know, if you can do that. Now, if you're a specialist, great. If you have, you know, specialized interest, focus on those. I think that's what people say now is if you've got so strong identified strengths early on, fantastic. But if you don't, demonstrate that you are, you know, you're curious and you're intellectually curious, you um, can, will try different things. It doesn't all have to tie together in a neat bow in terms of, you know, a linear path. I think that's something that I have really, really learned because it's, it's kind of, you know, the diversity of your experience and who you've worked with is, is really key. And I think that now, especially with, you know, applications considering you know, a variety of things other than let's just say GPA and test scores. I think there's really an opportunity for you to shine in different ways. So please be encouraged. And, you know, I've also heard that sometimes people don't go to UCs right away. They might go to community colleges. I know Villanova is very much a, you know, a um, college bound group, but also the transfer programs in from community, community colleges are really, really strong um, at Davis. So, um, you know, it's something that honestly our chancellor is really proud of and really advocating for. So, sorry, my phone's ringing. I think we'll stop. Oh, let me look at the chat. Okay. Oh, what's been the highlight of my career so far? Uh, let's see, goodness gracious. Okay, well, I think honestly, um, when I connected with that mentor, um, it was long ago, as I mentioned, 20 years ago. Um, I really felt like I had found like a really good person who was kind of similar to me and had a similar set of interests and someone that I felt that I could really connect with. I mean, he was, you know, um, he, you know, he was from a different walk of life than me. He was a different person completely privately, but career-wise, we really connected and we had similar interests and I really could understand his perspective and how he got from point A to point B to point C. So I think it was really finding that great mentor, to be honest with you. And uh, it kind of helped me crystallize where I wanted to go a little bit. So, um, you know, I, I'd had a lot of different educational preparation, but I couldn't really find my path. And so these special relationships helped me. And, you know, they don't have to be, you know, they don't, they can be anybody that you connect with it. There's no cookie cutter, you know, um, view of what a mentor should look like or be, honestly. So, thank you. Let's see. I think that's it. So, do we have any other questions from anyone before we let Mary go? <laughs> well, Mary, this has been wonderful. Thank you so very much for sharing your words of wisdom with us and with our students. It's very helpful. And I guess what I'd like to ask is if you're comfortable, can people shoot you an email if they have uh, additional questions? Yes, yes, I invite that. Absolutely. I've got okay. my email on the slide thing. And I think Tim's got my email. And 
tap, you know, whatever. I'd be super happy to to chat with anybody. So. Wonderful. Thank you. And we do hope you're coming down for the alumni barbecue. Yes, right. 25th. I have my little card. I have to get that on my calendar. So. Okay. Sounds Great. very good. Well, thank you so much, everyone. It's great thank to see you. Best much. wishes to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you.